relieved this morning to, to wake up and uh, woke up an hour earlier um, because I don't sleep longer when we have time change. But I was reading on social media and uh, was reminded by some people, and it was a reminder for pastors, uh, you get an extra hour to preach today. So um, buckle up, right? <laughs> Uh, no, but seriously, we are uh, we're partway through this series we've called A Blessing in Disguise. What, we're, what are we doing? We're going through the eight Beatitudes of Jesus. What does the word Beatitude mean? It just is a Latin word for blessed. And so in these eight, you know, very succinct statements, Jesus is being very intentional, and he's also... Uh, sort of veiling blessing because some of the things he says that are blessed aren't things that we would normally consider blessed, but Jesus calls them blessed. And so they're blessings in disguise. Now, my family and I really enjoy watching the TV show America's Got Talent. And I will say that I'm more along for the ride. Okay. It's okay. My kids really love it. And it's a wildly popular show. We enjoy it as a family. And one of the reasons why I think it's so popular is not only do you get to see uh, you know, wild acts of talent or, or music or, or, or any, you know, any imaginable kind of group act. What's really intriguing about the show and why it's so popular is because there's four judges. And it's funny to me because some of the judges really have no experience in like some of the acts that they're judging. You know, some of them do, but some of them don't. And it's interesting to me after there's an act to hear you know, what was the, like the criteria that went into there? This was a good act or this was a bad act. And, and probably why this show is so popular and shows like it so popular is because at home on our couch, we get to judge the acts, you know? We have our own criteria. I didn't like that song or I don't like dancing or, you know, whatever. And so it's so fun because we all get to be judge. We all get to, you know, look at, and a lot of times it's very entertaining things, and, it, and it's wild, but, but there's a certain criteria that sometimes is really hilarious from the actual judges, and then even in our own living room, some of the criteria can be interesting. Today in our series, In the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, there's an important transition that's taking place. Uh, several people, um, and I'll... I'll point out Tim Keller is the one that I heard say this, but, but ha- have, have seen that there sort of seems to be like a transition in the middle of the Beatitudes. The first four, well, they say something, and what they really say, and then what they've really taught us, and what we've really learned is how someone enters the kingdom of God. The criteria for someone entering the kingdom of God. And what is that criteria? The criteria is when someone is poor in spirit, when someone knows that there is a problem, that there's a a deep spiritual problem, and blessed are they when they mourn over that problem and their own personal sin in that problem. Blessed are the meek, those who, as they've been weakened, realize that they need to change, that they need to submit, that their ways don't work, it's led to poverty, And now they need to look to Jesus. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And so there's a change that needs to be made. So blessed are people who realize that there's something broken and that only through looking to Jesus can it be fixed. That's how you know if someone's in the kingdom of God, is they've realized all of those things and now they're looking to Jesus. And for the second half of the Beatitudes we are sort of learning the criteria for now that someone's in the kingdom, what is that someone like? What are some defining characteristics or some qualities that would, would be describing someone who is in the kingdom of God? What is that someone like? What is someone who's encountered their sin? They know the depths of it. They've been so humbled by it. And now they're hungering and thirsting only for the ways of Jesus first and foremost. So the first part of the Beatitudes is the criteria for the entry into the kingdom of God. And the second half, well, that's how you judge. Is someone actually in there? Are they looking the part? Are they following like as a real genuine Christian who 
who has entered the kingdom of God. The order is so intentional. And can you guess what the, what the first criteria that, that is used by Jesus to, to describe what a Christian should be like? What, like? What's the first trait that we should be able to tell? And here it is, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Right off the bat, for anyone who is a Christ follower, a Christ follower is a merciful person, is somebody who shows mercy. And this shouldn't be a surprise. Jesus is most known for mercy, not treating people as their actions deserve. And if you are a Christian, you know you need to be shown incredible mercy to enter the kingdom. And so therefore, showing mercy is what you do if you're a follower of Christ when someone hurts you or wrongs you or crosses you. It's what you do. Blessed are the merciful. And this is kind of bothersome. It is, because when someone wrongs you or someone hurts you, there's something in us that desires justice. You know, they, they deserve punishment. They deserve to hurt. They deserve to pay. Which makes me pause for a second and ask, why do we feel that anyway when someone wrongs us? It's like there's this universal moral law that surfaces whenever someone wrongs us. And for some people who would say, well, well, there is no God, my question would be, why do we care so much about right and wrong then? Or why do we have something in us that when someone wrongs us, we just demand justice? That shouldn't be. They should pay for what they did. Now, there's two ways that, pretty much two ways, there could be more, that people decide right and wrong. And one way is objectively, which means you need some objective source to say, okay, this is universally right and this is universally wrong. And most cultures get this, right? I mean, murder's wrong everywhere. And then there is subjectivity. So typically, right and wrong is determined by a group of people, a culture of people, now, the problem with the second one is that what happens is if you get a bunch of people together, you get a nation together, and they call something that is actually wrong right, it actually covers up justice and causes injustice. So think about some of the egregious acts of history. All that happened because someone said, well, this is actually okay. And because we can decide and there's no higher power, we can just do whatever we want. The hard part about letting an objective truth be your moral guide is that you have to say there has to be something like God outside of creation that has said this is right, this is wrong every single time. Now, even more unsettling is the language used in this text. And we can't undo it. I want to undo it. You want to undo it. But I can't undo it because if we undo it, if we undo the language in this text, the connecting blessing, blessed are the merciful, did you see the connection? For they will be shown mercy. If we undo this part, then we have to undo all the other beatitudes we like. Because we like the part that says, you know, they will be filled. Or they will be comforted. We like those. But the question that this text just brings up, and we can't ignore it, is, is, is our experience, is my experience, is your experience of divine mercy... How connected is it to our actual expression of mercy? Did you see it? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We can't escape it. Because it shows up in other places in the Sermon on the Mount, which is what Jesus is kicking off in this, you know, beatitude list. And Matthew 7, you've heard this verse. Verse 1, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. 
And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, this isn't a verse saying we shouldn't judge people. This is a verse warning us what comes with judging people. It's, it's a verse really poking at what is your criteria for administering justice, you know, pay for that wrong you did, and showing mercy. And is there a criteria? I mean, wh- where do you get your criteria? How do you decide when you're in position to judge? How do, how do you decide who gets, you know, your justice and your wrath and who gets your mercy? Like, how do we do, is there a criteria we can look to so we do this right? And there is one. A few more verses down. Matthew 7, verse 12 says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So maybe what you need isn't another Bible study. What you need is to memorize this verse and apply it. Right? Listen, every, in everything, so you're to show mercy to who? To others in everything. And here's the truth. Some others are easier to show mercy to because they're more contrite or you have you know, a history of good to lean on. But what this is saying is no matter the offense, the circumstances, or the pain, we are to do to others what we would have them do for ourselves. So how do you do this? How do you show mercy when someone hurts you? When you're in position, because most of us, we withhold it because it's hard. It's hard to show it. And what I want to do is I want to look at an Old Testament character for just a little bit. His name is Joseph. He, he might be, this might be my all-time favorite Old Testament story. It's just a wonderful story. And it's a story about mercy and forgiveness. And we're going to look at Joseph. We're going to see how he finds himself in a position to either judge harshly or show mercy to some people close to him. Now, Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. Remember Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And in his teenage years, his father, Jacob, uh, gives Joseph a very beautiful coat of colors. And Joseph wears that coat, and his brothers hate him for it, you know, because he's the first son of, J- of his favorite wife. And, and so they just, every time they see, you know, Joseph wearing this, this coat, they're just reminded of how much, how much they wish they were the favorite, you know. And, and so they, they just sort of, he has several brothers. And, uh, and not only was he having this favor from his father and this, you know, piece of clothing that they wish they had, he was also gifted, like an intelligent young man. He, he was specifically gifted with the ability to understand and interpret dreams we learn. And at the age of around 17, Joseph has a dream. And then he tells his dad and his older brothers, and his, I had this dream, and here's what it basically means. I saw all of you bowing down to me. And they all look at him, even his dad, like, well, that's just crazy, Joseph. That doesn't happen. And it only added more fuel to the jealousy fire that was burning inside of his brothers. And one day, Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers. And they see him coming. And and the text says, here comes that dreamer. You know, you could tell that they've just harbored just so much against him. And then they plot to kill him. Genesis 37 23 and following says this. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him into the cistern, which is where they would have kept water, so a big hole. The the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? 
I know. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. Even though the oldest sort of protested a little bit and tried to stop them, and apparently he steps away. But what we have to see right here is, is Joseph's brothers just engaged in some sinful behavior. And their actions were rash and emotional. It just, they weren't planning to do it that day. They just got flustered emotionally because they've been harboring unforgiveness towards their father, maybe, towards their brother. And then they have, you know, maybe the most disturbing thing as, as they're waiting to figure out how they're going to kill their brother, they stop to have lunch. It's just it's so disturbing. And in the middle of that lunch, they get this twisted thinking. It's okay to sell him, but not okay to kill him. It's okay to treat him this way, but not that way. And they figure out a way to cover up doing something unjust. And let me just say this, this pause here. And this is so sad. And people have the potential over lunch to hurt and plot and cover up something so egregious. And it's so sad. And perhaps you know what it's like to be in Joseph's shoes, to be stripped of your freedom, of the upbringing you deserved. You know what it's like to be unhonored by somebody, to be stripped of your dignity, for someone to take something from you, for someone close to you to call what they do to you or did to you or say to you, to call it okay, to disguise it. So many of us know what it's like to be hurt by something they did, or she did, or he said, or she didn't do. And it's not right. Because what happens is, when someone hurts us, we get let off to slavery, and we have to deal with the consequences of their gross misconduct. And it's not okay. You know, uh, my son the other day uh, hurt, hurt himself, and he just starts crying and crying and crying and crying. And, uh, and I just see how much in pain he is from injuring himself accidentally, didn't mean to. And I just kind of got down on his level, and I just looked right at him, and I, and I just said, hey, are you all right? No, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And, and I just told him, I know it does. So sorry. So sorry that you were hurt. And he continues to cry. And just, you know, just, just being there with him, just acknowledging that he was hurt. And then over some time, the sobs started to go away and it didn't hurt quite as much. But but see, in that moment when he was hurt, he needed to hear from someone else that he was hurt. And it was okay to be hurt. It was okay to say that I was hurt as he's wrestling with those pains. And we need to do that too. I'm so sorry. Maybe you need to hear this because you've never heard it. I'm so sorry for the hurt that they caused, for the hurt that you continually have to see and feel. It is wrong. It was wrong. And it's okay that you feel hurt by it. So jo Joseph's brothers sell him to these slave traders, and he ends up being purchased by a man named Potiphar in Egypt. Now, Potiphar seemed to be a pretty well-off guy, and Joseph, as he's sold after he's been hurt by his family, he could have folded. But instead, he decides to be faithful. And 
he does so well at his slave job that he becomes promoted, you know? And Potiphar just entrusts him with, with everything in his household. Over some time, Potiphar's wife apparently develops a physical attraction to Joseph. He's gifted, he's young, he's handsome, and he continuously resists her requests for encounters with him and her. But one time, she makes a, an aggressive pass at him, you know? And Joseph, it says, he just flees, you know, and she has her, his robe in her hand, right? And he's out of there. Well, Potiphar's wife then lies and wrongs Joseph again. Says that he was trying to be the aggressor. What ends up happening to Joseph is he gets thrown in prison. So it went from bad to worse. And here's Joseph in prison. And once again, he's wronged. And he could fold or he could be faithful. And he decides to be faithful. And what ends up happening is rather than building resentment, he begins to uh, you know, work hard and earn trust of people around him. And he's promoted again, you know? And while in prison, he meets uh, some people from Pharaoh's court, the king of Egypt. And he meets a baker and a cupbearer, and they both have dreams. And Joseph is able to interpret their dreams, and he helps them. It worked out well for one and not so much for the other. Uh, the the cupbearer promises then, hey, I'm going to remember you when I get out of here. Thank you so much, you know. But he doesn't. And Joseph is wronged. Again, he's lied to this time. The cupbearer forgets him, doesn't keep his word. And so here we have Joseph, you know, about 13 years into this nightmare, and he's been hurt repeatedly and let down repeatedly. And he hasn't deserved it one ounce, and there's been no justice whatsoever. And then Pharaoh has a weird dream. And the cupbearer, who happens to overhear that Pharaoh has a weird dream, remembers, I know a guy that can help you, and they summon Joseph. And so Joseph comes in, he hears the dream, he's able to take this weird dream about cows and wheat, and he's able to tell Pharaoh what that means. Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of, of plenty, we're going to be so well in our agriculture, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so what I think we should do, uh, he didn't, wasn't asked what he should do, but he said, here's what I think we should do. We should develop a plan in the first seven years, store it all up so for the next seven years we're good to go. And Pharaoh is incredibly impressed with him. In fact, Pharaoh is so thankful for this that he makes Joseph the second in command. Joseph is now the second in command to the most powerful man in the world. And he's in charge of the food distribution. And it just so happens that a famine hits back home, just like Joseph predicts. And the brothers, Joseph's brothers, are sent to Egypt because they need food, and all the food is in Egypt. Genesis 42, verse 6 says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. The people that sold him, that ruined a decade or more of his life. But he pretended to be a stranger, and he spoke harshly to them. Where did you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Fancy the situation. Joseph now has his brothers. I mean, they're in his grasp. You know, it's been nearly 20 years, maybe, of pain, of remembering what happened to him. And there seems to be, there may not be, but it seems to be a tension in him about what to do with this. Do it. Is this the moment I get back at them? But then in verse 9, it says, he remembered his dreams about them. Remember the ones they said he was crazy about? And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. And in that moment, 
where you got to imagine he's flooded with feelings of wanting to get back at them because he has the power to do so. He lets his faith trump his feelings. It gets worse because in verse 11, listen to how his brothers answer his interrogation. They say, we are the sons of one man. Your servants, speaking about themselves, are honest men, not spies. Can you imagine when Joseph hears these men say they're honest? Could you imagine all of the emotions? Good men, honest men. So what do you do when you're in position to show mercy? Someone has wronged you. They don't deserve it. You've walked and lived with the hurt. What do you do? Joseph begins to interrogate them about his family. He finds out that he has a brother, a younger brother, a full-blooded brother named Benjamin, who has become daddy's new favorite. And then he devises a plan. And he tells the, the, the men, his brothers, he says, well, I need, to, I need you to prove that you're honest and trustworthy. So why don't you leave one of, one of you here, go back and bring the other brother. And then I'll know that you're not lying to me. And so with, you know, they push back on it, but then they go home. Um, and on the way back, the brothers begin to connect the dots. They, they still don't know who Joseph is, but, but they start to feel guilty. They feel like that things are turning on them because of how they treated Joseph so long ago. And then as they go, they find out that Joseph actually commanded to keep the silver that they brought to pay for grain in their bags. And so now they're like, we're in a really bad spot. Eventually, they get back to home and then they have to spend a long time convincing Jacob to let them take Benjamin because that's his favorite son and he doesn't want to lose his second favorite here. Finally, he says, okay, we need food. They run out of food and then they go back and they're brought into where Joseph is and I want you to watch this in, in Genesis 43, verse 30. Joseph sees his younger brother deeply moved at the sight of his brother Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. After he had washed his face, he came out and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. When he sees his brother who he's never met and he sees his brothers who have wronged him, he feels all the hurt, all the history he understands what he has the opportunity to do here. And he leaves their presence because his emotions want him to let them have it. And he, he just has to withdraw because he has to let himself feel what's going on. And then he comes back. Do, do you see this? He serves his brother's lunch. The same brothers who sold him over lunch, he decides to feed them. And then he sends them on. And he actually plants a silver cup, his silver cup, in his younger, in his, in his full-blooded brother Benjamin's backpack so that they would notice and be forced to come back. And when they do, he can't contain himself any longer and he reveals that he's their brother and then when he does, he weeps even more. And, and we see this over and over in Joseph's story, that he, he has to, you know, weep and feel these emotions. Why does he keep weeping? And I'm going to tell you why. It's because for over a decade, he has trusted that mercy is better than bitter. It's better than holding a grudge. And now it's, it's come full circle. And he, he, he's seeing that that was the right choice. Pharaoh then invites the whole family to Egypt to have the best land of their choosing. Jacob eventually dies, which triggers fear in his other brothers. Let's read about it in Genesis 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, 
What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I asked you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph is in the position of judge. And he has choice. Will I be the grudge-holding governor or will I be the grace-filled brother? The one he never had, by the way. Will I do for them what I wished they would have done for me? What measure will I use? When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers and came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. What do you do when someone wrongs you? You are merciful. And when you're merciful, you will be shown mercy because you've learned in your journey that being merciful is better than being bitter. Now, how is Joseph able to actually do this? Well, there's seven steps that help him show mercy and maybe will help you show mercy. And these are gonna be really quick. The first thing is he acknowledged the hurt. Joseph didn't sweep what they did under the rug. It was wrong. It was sin. He never lied to himself and said, well, they didn't mean to hurt me. No, he he knew they hurt him. He acknowledged it. In order to show mercy, you're never going to be able to do it until you can acknowledge the full reality of what was done. The second thing he does in his life stories, he commits to act honestly. See, Joseph, in his hurt, had a choice. And he became determined that he was going to be different than the brothers who hurt him. And so whether he was a slave or a prisoner or the governor, he was going to be the kind of person that did for others what he wished was done for him. Joseph could have built resentment, but instead he wanted to live different. And so he committed to live honestly and faithfully all throughout his life, differently than his brothers. The third thing is, this is a hunch of mine, I think Joseph practiced forgiveness before he had to really give forgiveness to his brothers. He experienced several wrongs, how do, how do we learn how to forgive people? Practice. Maybe if you, there's a big thing you need to forgive someone, maybe work on making small acts of forgiveness and the little things that happen throughout the day with your coworkers, with your family members. You gotta practice forgiveness to be able to forgive big things. Start forgiving small offenses. See, I think Joseph was able to forgive in this moment because I think he learned how to forgive over the you know, last decade or so of his life. I think he had forgiven them before he even saw them. The fourth thing that you'll need is you'll need to process your emotions. 
if you notice, throughout Joseph's life and in this story, he had a plan to process. He didn't react emotionally. He, he knew he needed to process these feelings, and he, he had a place where he could go and weep. And you need that too. And I need that too. A private place. Maybe it's a friend that comes alongside of you. And, and you, just, you, you just have to walk through it, you know? If you want to get to a place of mercy. See, he was allowed to f- fully feel his emotions. And if you've been hurt, you're not going to move forward. You're not going to be able to show mercy until you allow yourself to fully feel the emotions. So much so that now you can react not in an equal corresponding emotional manner, but you can act with control. And it's so important because we want our words and our actions to not mirror the words and the actions of the people that have hurt us. The fifth thing we see Joseph doing in a step for you to show mercy is to trust God's perspective. And this is hard because we have to trust that something good can come out of the worst evil. And so as we're trying to live honestly and as we're trying to treat others the way that we wish we were treated, it's going to not feel like a blessing. It's going to not feel like progress because we're still carrying the pain of hurt. But we have to trust that God's perspective is at work. We're not excusing wrongdoing. We're actually disarming wrongdoing. We're conquering it. When we choose to see that God is going to work this out. The sixth thing we see Joseph doing here at the end of his life when his brothers think he's going to just second guess his forgiveness is what we see we see him maintaining full forgiveness when you forgive someone and you show mercy to someone what happens is it gets triggered it gets tested all it takes is seeing a picture hearing a way somebody says something And when we're tested and triggered in life, we want to make sure that we're maintaining forgiveness. We're not partially forgiving. We're not, you know, half forgiving. That we genuinely want to show mercy. And so what this means is showing mercy will mean that you have to walk through all the processing of forgiveness, sometimes more than you want, sometimes daily but this is what you want to do. Because if you don't, if you don't, and if you revert and say, I'm just going to treat them the way they deserve, then all we're doing then is mirroring poor behavior for poor behavior. And we are going to be the ones who change the cycle of wrongdoing. And the last thing you need to do is you need to surrender the seat of governor. I'm not the judge. I have the power to hold a grudge, but instead, I'm going to show mercy. You may have heard the story before, but in South India, there are uh, monkey traps that are used to stop pesky monkeys from stealing food from, from communities. And so what they do is they take a coconut and they hollow out the coconut, and they put some sort of food in there, like rice or a banana or something, and they hollow it out just enough for the monkey to be able to stick his hand in there, but if he grabs a hold of the food and squeezes it tight, he is unable to pull a fisted hand out of the coconut. And so he's trapped. He wants what's in the coconut so bad He's unwilling to let go of it for freedom. So many of us want to hold on. They deserve, you know, wrath and punishment, and I'm never going to forgive them. And we're just holding on to hurt and holding on to pain. And what is it doing? It, it's, it's imprisoning us. And so what do we need to do? We need to let go. 
so we can live free. Forgiveness is letting go of the power to judge and embracing the blessing. Although you won't see it at first, the blessing of mercy. You'll never be free so long as you're holding on to the wrongdoing because it affects you and makes you someone you don't want to be. It doesn't mean you have to get close to that person again. It just means you're going to release them and thereby heal yourself. How do we do that? All you need to do is simply look to who Joseph points to. Joseph points to Jesus, who voluntarily took off his governor robe of the universe to put on the robe of humanity. And like Joseph, Jesus was stripped by his brothers and he wept over the pain that happens in the human world. And what was intended to harm him, Jesus endured it. Listen to how Peter puts it. When they hurled their insults at him on the cross, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Every single one of us is the brother whose sin put Jesus there. And if Joseph refuses to use his power to judge, and if Jesus refuses, at least initially, why do we persist on holding on to what only will hurt us and prevent us from healing? How do we heal? If you know mercy, you will show mercy. And mercy is a person. Do you know him? Do you know what he's done for you? Do you know the sin he took off of you willingly and voluntarily? He endured the pain of the cross so that you can be free. And take hope in this, that when you don't know what to do with the hurt that someone has caused you, just like God does with your hurt, you can hurl it at the cross. Because one day, Jesus, the only righteous judge, judge, will judge the world. And everyone who hasn't been shown mercy will see justice. And Jesus is the only one that gets to arbitrate who gets mercy and who gets justice. So maybe today, you can't show mercy because you don't know mercy. You haven't confessed your sins and experienced Jesus in your life and what he's done for you. You need to begin a relationship with him. Maybe today, you need to show mercy. You know mercy. And now it's time, it's time to let go, to be healed. Our sins, though they are many, his mercy is more. Let's pray. God, thank you. Let's thank you for this, this time where we get to reflect on the, the cross. You didn't retaliate. You became suffering. And it's my hurt and my pain that hung on there with you, my sin on there with you. Help every single one of us in this room, God, to believe it when you say, blessed are the merciful. Help us to show mercy in the way that you've shown us mercy, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you stand?